or turn them off. Have them break. Join us. When I start this, everyone. When I start this, and I'm uh, really excited to be here today. A very important topic. My name is Carlos Benchaca, New York City Council Member and Chair of the Immigration Committee. I want to thank uh, my co-chair uh, for this committee, uh, the Justice the Justice Committee with Lori, Rory Lansman, Council Member from Queens. Um, just shy of two years ago in 2017, Chair Lansman and I held the first joint public hearing documenting ICE presence in New York courts five months into the current federal administration. Today we are back to hear a full report of both the rise in ICE presence at courthouses across the city and the detrimental impact ICE presents, uh, the ICE presence has had on our justice system. Additionally, we are here to, to make a case for the state to pass legislation and the Office of Court Administration to promulgate rules that would protect the sanctity of our state courts and the criminal justice system. As such, the Committee on Immigration will also be holding a first hearing today on Resolution 828, co-sponsored by myself and Chair, La uh, Chair Lansman, calling on the state legislature to pass and the governor to sign the Protect Our Courts Act in order to protect certain interested parties or people from civil arrest, civil arrest while going to, remaining at, or returning from the place of such court proceeding. Immediately after the 2017 presidential inauguration, the Trump administration laid out its mass deportation agenda in an executive order. It was called Enhancing Public Safety in the Interior of the United States. This agenda included, among other things, following immigrants at their state level court appearances in criminal court, civil courts, such as family court and problem solving courts, such as human trafficking court. This was a distinct shift from immigration enforcement under the Obama administration. And since, 20, since 2016, the Immigrant Defense Project, IDP, has documented an increase of 1,736%. Of a it's a 1,736% increase in ICE court house enforcement and in and around our state courts. A majority of these reports come from New York City, with Brooklyn and Queens reporting the largest number of arrests. We will hear extensive reports today from IDP, as well as the Bronx Legal uh, Services, Bronx Legal Services, and many of the other social and legal service providers that have seen clients affected by this policy shift. And this is a shift that's happening on a daily basis, and we want to hear from all of you. And what I want to make sure that we all understand today is that immigration enforcement at the state courthouses is incompatible with the functioning of our justice system. Law enforcement agencies from the district attorney offices to the attorney general's office have publicly condemned ICE for disrupting the trust between New York's immigrant residents and law enforcement. We hear stories of individuals who forego calling the police when they are victims of crimes or involved in domestic disputes for fear that ICE will show up at a related court proceeding. Public defender organizations and judges have also reported how ICE's recent tactics have interfered with the administration of justice. There has been a measurable drop in participation in criminal justice programs, problem-solving courts, and civil courts as a result of ICE presence. These strains on our justice system can, make, can only make our city less safe. ICE agents attempted to arrest a woman in Queens human trafficking court last summer, creating such a panic that other trafficking survivors were terrified to leave the courtroom. ICE is eavesdropping on privileged attorney-client conversations and literally stalking attorneys to arrest their clients. ICE is increasing their use of force and surveillance with agents surrounding individuals with guns drawn. One woman in Brooklyn had her son snatched by plainclothes ICE agents and thrown into a car. They shoved her against a wall and repeatedly told her to shut up. She thought her son had been kidnapped until, she called her, uh, until they called her from the ICE detention center. These are traumatic experiences ICE is putting on our community, communities. 
And this is, very, this is a very clear um, indication of a rogue agency, rogue operation, and with the sole mission of deporting as many people as possible with no care for due process. So we are here, and we are watching, and we will make sure that we rise up and that we raise our collect collective voices so that we can bring attention to the issue and call for ICE to be held accountable. We will not stand by and let this happen. I want to thank all the advocates that are here today and you've been with us, not just in these public hearings, but you've been working with us at the City Council and all the other advocates um, and leaders in government. Because it's important to know that it is not just an over-exaggerated, sporadic telling of stories that we are hearing. This is happening every day and it's happening to all our communities. And there's clear data that shows how disruptive and destructive ICE's tactics are. This is a deliberate attack on our city and our state. I'll repeat that. It's a deliberate attack. This is a strategy. This is the deportation machine. So, uh, and, and this is more a fact, ICE has stated it's in its own policies that courthouses arrests are a direct result of the increasing unwillingness of some jurisdictions to cooperate with ICE. That's New York City. We have made it law. And because of that, some law enforcement agencies no longer honor ICE detainers or limit ICE's access, access to detention facilities. And we're proud of that here in, the New York, in New York City. In ICE's own words, they are targeting sanctuary cities for intrusion in courthouse proceedings. They're making a direct connection and we will not stand by and let this federal administration continue to target our residents, our families, and our neighbors. So I want to thank everyone who prepared this hearing, my chief of staff, uh, Soshi Meng, my communications director, uh, and brand new father, uh, uh, Tony Chirito, and the whole committee staff, the committee council, Harbani Ausha, committee policy analyst, Elizabeth Kronk, and the, sta and the entire staff of the Justice uh, System Committee. With that, I'm gonna hand it over to my co-chair, uh, Rory Lansman. Thank you, Councilmember Menchaca. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Councilman Rory Lansman, chair of the Committee on the Justice System. Uh, we've been joined by our newest member of our committee, Danny Drum. Welcome. And uh, thank you to Councilmember Menchaca for leading this important joint hearing on ICE in New York courthouses. Almost two years ago, our two committees held a hearing about what was then the recently expanded practice of sending ICE agents into our courts. Since then, our judicial system has been even more seriously undermined by the insidious, predatory practices of ICE agents who stalk our courthouses and make defendants, litigants, victims, and witnesses afraid to appear. It makes our society less fair and all of us less safe. Thanks to the meaningful work of the ICE Out of Courts Coalition and the report that they released today, we know that six, since 2016, there has been a 1,736% increase in ICE operations in and around New York's courthouses. In Queens alone, 60 people have actually been arrested in the last two years. But how many others have been scared off or had to weigh showing up against possibly never returning home. The fear pervades every aspect of our justice system, stretching far beyond criminal defendants. District attorneys have talked about how immigrant victims are less likely to report crimes, leaving perpetrators unaccountable for their actions. Between 2016 and 2018, there was a 72% decline in U visa requests legal visas available to crime victims. 56% of legal services providers and advocates say their clients are afraid of even filing a complaint in housing court. The city's family justice centers, which provide services to victims of domestic violence and sex trafficking, but are not officially affiliated with the court system, even saw a 10% decline in new foreign-born clients from 2016 to 2017. Our judicial system breaks down when defendants ignore court appearances, when prosecutors cannot get victims and witnesses to testify, when domestic abusers can, get, uh, can act with impunity, or when people refuse to cooperate. Unfortunately, many immigrants must make the decision to avoid the justice system or risk detention 
or deportation at the courthouse door. Today we are also here in support of the Protect Our Courts Act, a bill in the state legislature to exempt individuals from civil arrest while going to, remaining at, or returning from the place of such court proceeding, unless agents provide a judicial warrant, <clears throat> a judicial warrant or a court order authorizing the arrest. Any person attending court and proceeding in good faith should have access to due process and public safety. The Protect Our Courts Act will ensure that the court system operates effectively. It is gratifying to see that the state is taking steps to address this enormous problem. But we have the ability to call for change right here in our city. Our district attorneys in particular must use every tool at their disposal to limit the effect of ICE's actions on immigrant New Yorkers. That includes immigration sensitive charging, plea offices, offers and sentencing, working with defenders to reduce the number of unnecessary in-person court appearances, and declining to prosecute low-level cases that shouldn't be handled by the criminal justice system in the first place. District attorneys can play a critical role in fighting Trump's deportation machine. We look forward to hearing from legal services providers, immigrant advocacy organizations, and others about what they are seeing in our courthouses and in immigrant communities, and what steps the city and other governmental actors can take to defend the integrity of our judicial system. Now, with that, let me also recognize that we have our other new member to our Committee on the Justice System, Council Member Brad Lander from Brooklyn. And um, if you don't mind, I will introduce my colleague from Queens, yes. Council Member Francisco Moyer. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chair, could I just say it's an honor to join this committee, and I look forward to serving. Today we have a hearing next door as well, so I'll be back and forth, but I'm looking forward to serving on it. Thank you. Thank you. We're going we're gonna to hand, uh, we are going to call up our first panel, a public panel, and we're ex really excited because we're going to get to hear from you all on the report uh, and other work. We can call up the Immigrant Defense Project, Missouri. And uh, Mizuya Aziki, and then Ms. Terry Lawson, please, from the Legal Services of New York City, to come on up. Who wants to start? Red, red, uh, red light on, and then bring it closer to you. Bring it closer. There you go. And that I can hear you. Camera's on top of my head, right there. Okay. Um, sorry. I'm, I, apologies. I'm recovering from a cold, so I'm a little congested. But thank you for having me. So thank you very much to the Immigration and uh, Criminal Justice Committees for giving IDP the opportunity to speak today about this critical and urgent issue. Um, my name is Mizue Izeki. I'm the acting executive director of the Immigrant Defense Project an organization that focuses to expand and protect the rights of people caught at this intersection of the criminal, legal, and immigration systems. Um, as the council member mentioned in the beginning, IDP has been tracking ICE enforcement operations in New York for a number of years, and we've specifically monitored ICE presence and activity in and around the courthouses. Um, in the uh, report, which is available today, uh, the courthouse trap in January, I thought I had a copy to show around. Oh, here it is. Um, uh, IDP and for all the members, it's this one on your, then, on your... That's Terry's. Well, that's both. Okay, there's two. This is the January one. Okay, that's well, the January you one. Know, every that three know months, we're going to issue a report. No, not. Okay. Ah, um, <laughs> okay, so this is a... This is a um, documenting ICE activity in and around courthouses over the past two years. And as a council member mentioned, uh, we've found a 1,700% increase um, since the Trump administration started. And I think this point about targeting cities like New York that are uh, working and trying to protect immigrant rights is a really important point to bring out. Um, this is a deportation machine that does not discriminate against who it targets, but also, you know, the very heart of it is to devalue people. Um, and I think that the very many stories that we have here and also the report that Terry's gonna talk about, and also the testimony from us, our other 
coalition members and allies today just really highlights you know, the dehumanizing process and how it's really tearing away at the fabric of our communities. Um, so just a couple highlights from the report. Um, you know, one of the things that we've documented is that ICE has, uh, you know, in addition to targeting courthouses, they've also become very aggressive in their practices. You mentioned the story of the mother that was pushed against the wall by ICE. We've also seen, you know, individuals dragged from their cars, um, people, uh, ICE pulling guns on people at the courthouse. You know, and then I think another significant trend um, that this legislation addresses is that ICE has expanded its practice to not only sitting inside courthouses waiting for people to arrest, but also arresting people um, on their way to court and also after leaving court as well. Um, and so, you know, ICE has sent a very clear message to immigrant communities and the jurisdictions that safeguard their rights that nobody uh, is to be valued, no one is to be safe. And I just want to highlight, you know, that there have been calls made from judges, you know, 70 judges from across the country issued a letter in December um, call in, from 23 states calling on ICE to stop this practice, as you can see in this report, and the one um, that we issued today, uh, district attorneys and attorney generals and anti-violence advocates and public defenders have been also calling um, for ICE to end this practice. And so since ICE has made it clear that it does not see itself as accountable to anybody, waiting for ICE to change its own policy is foolish at best and at worst dangerously complicit. So IDP thanks the City Council for recognizing this urgency and for uh, considering the proposal, the resolution in support of the Protect Our Court Acts. Just uh, to reiterate some of the things that this bill does, uh, this bill responds to ICE's unlawful courthouse arrest practice by requiring a judicial warrant or court order for a civil arrest of anyone attending court. Because ICE has stated that no group of immigrants is off limits, the bill protects uh, litigants, witnesses, and even those who accompany individuals to court. The bill also makes sure that if federal agents will willfully violate the law, that there is cause for action for that violation. These enforcement provisions provide meaningful resolutions and meaningful recognition of immigrants' rights under the law. Okay. Yeah, um, let's make sure that doesn't that doesn't open again, please. Thank you. <laughs> I thought it was someone heckling me. I just couldn't. <laughs> All right. The bill also, sorry, the bill also ameliorates the confusion and chaos caused by the disruptions to court function caused by ICE arrests. It creates a clear protocol for court staff to follow regarding civil immigration enforcement operations and requires law enforcement agents to present a judicial warrant or court order. So thank you again for your attention to this issue. Thank you for that. Terry? Thank you for this opportunity to testify about ICE operations in and around New York courts. My name is Terry Lawson. I'm the director of the Family and Immigration Unit of Bronx Legal Services and Office of Legal Services NYC. I also co-lead the Bronx Immigration Partnership, a network of over 20 organizations and agencies working together to create a coordinated legal safety net of legal and social services for Bronx residents. Today we provide you with, and we make public, a report entitled Safeguarding the Integrity of Our Courts, the Impact of ICE Courthouse Operations in New York State. And we have copies on the table if people would like to pick up a copy. This report is the first of its kind, a true collaborative effort of the most unlikely allies, including prosecutors, public defenders, anti-violence attorneys, immigration advocates, and judges all of whom care about the integrity of the court and what happens when ICE is allowed to patrol the courts as their own personal hunting ground. This report documents what we have been seeing and saying since January 2017, that the dramatic rise in ICE courthouse operations damages the New York Unified Court System. Courthouse operations are up 1,700%, as Mizue said, since 2016. Visits by new foreign-born residents are down 10% in New York Family Justice Centers, as um, Councilmember Lanceman told the audience to begin with. And there was a 100% decline in victims of crime seeking U visa certifications in Manhattan Family Court. I am here today to ask the New York City Council to urge the New York State Office of Court Administration to adopt two court rules. The first court rule would require a judicial warrant for ICE to make an arrest in New York State Courthouse. And the second court rule would prohibit New York court employees from assisting ICE. 
For the past two and a half years, we have all been watching access to New York State courts deteriorate. Advocates of all kinds, many of whom are here today, have testified before the City Council. We have held press conferences on the city, city Hall steps outside. We have walked out of courthouses. We have conducted surveys, and we have written reports and op-eds. We have told countless stories about how the lack of court rules hurts plaintiffs and defendants, petitioners and respondents, witnesses and their family members, how the lack of court rules hurts prosecutors and public defenders, judges and court officers, anti-violence advocates and housing attorneys, but most importantly, how it hurts the judiciary, the branch of the government that is supposed to protect our most fundamental rights. The time to act is now. We cannot wait to see how much more ICE will erode access to our courts, how they will maneuver within and around the public property of the New York State courthouses before taking action. Enough is enough. Thank you. Well, I want to thank both of you, and we have a few questions before we, we let you off, and thanks for just setting the tone for not just the research, but the work that we're all going to be doing together to get this bill passed at the state level. And this is the only space uh, that is focused on immigration through the Immigration Committee, and this is a joint project, but uh, this is just a, a moment to realize that not even the state has a, an Immigration Committee and the Assembly and the Senate and this is where we get to talk about it and, and really galvanize our communities to support this kind of political campaign push to pass this bill. Uh, we've been joined by Councilmember Rose and Councilmember Miller. Uh, and thank you for being here today. So my, my first question is really about the, the, the kind of expression of data that shows the problem-solving courts and providers of court-mandated community service. Have you heard that this has resulted in fewer pleas that involve community service or, tr and, or treatment? Yes, that is what the report Can you talk a little bit about what, what, that, what that is? Yeah, so what, what you see in the report is a discussion about how, because ICE is being observed in the courthouses and where a lot of the community programs are also operating in the courthouses, when people see ICE in the courthouses or in the hallways outside of these programs, it does discourage defendants from opting into these community programs. And my colleagues who are public defenders who are in the office can certainly talk about that more. And can you walk us through the, the bill, the, the, the impact of the bill on the day-to-day -day operations from your perspective on the defender's side? What, what, what changes uh, the kind of mechanics of of how, how the, the court system can work differently with this bill. Can you, is there like a sense of expectation that you have from the bill itself right now well, that you can I, articulate? Um, I'll try my best. Sure. Just to be clear, I work with a lot of lawyers, but I'm not one, so take that with a grain of whatever you want to take. That's fine, and we're going to be asking <laughs> this question of everybody because we want to get a sense about the actual impact yeah. for people to get excited about getting on the campaign and, and pushing for this you know, I, I think that uh, the reason why this bill is so important in many ways, like as we know, ICE is terrorizing our communities in many places. This is one place where the government can actually say there's a government function here that we need to protect, and this is why this bill can happen. I think so, you know, this judicial warrant requirement, a lot of times it, what happens, and I, I, I assume the defenders, some of the defenders and people here will speak to it, is there's a lot of confusion when ICE comes to the court because they don't have uniforms on, right? They often don't announce themselves. We heard of an incident recently upstate where they just grabbed someone waiting online for a municipal ID that was offered to undocumented people trying to rip off his shirt to see if they could identify who he was, right? And so this is a type of havoc. People were running around and upset. You know, I think the idea that there, there will be some kind of set of rules that ICE has to obey, in addition to having a mechanism for saying if ICE doesn't obey this, then they can be sued. <laughs> Right, that just creates a different playing field, I feel like, in terms of a level of accountability that doesn't exist for ICE at this point, right? I think also in our experience, like court officers, even though there is a protocol, there's no real clear sense of what am I supposed to do when ICE comes here, right? And so, you know, we feel like this is a, a positive both for people attending court, people representing people who are in court, as well as the people who work there, that this is the baseline expectation for how our court is supposed to function, and ICE is only able to come here under very particular circumstances. 
And I think Councilmember Lanceman said something earlier in his remarks about how many how many more people have stayed home? How many more people do we not have we not heard from? Do we not know what the impact is? And as a practitioner who operates both in family court and in immigration court, to not be able to say to my clients that there is a rule that says, you know, unless there's a judicial warrant that has your name on it, you're not going to be taken out of a New York family court when you go there to get an order of protection or to get custody of your child. That is what we've been pointing at for the last two and a half years, that lack of guidance, of a rule, of something that we can say to our clients, look, there, we want this judicial warrant requirement because we want to be able to explain to people what's going to happen. Obviously, the judicial warrant requirement doesn't stop ICE from coming into the courts, but it does prevent this feeling of a free-for-all whenever ICE does enter the building. Can I just add one more point in terms of the legislation? I mean, I think it's really important, this point I, we raised about how ICE, you know, they surveil people at court and they wait for the, the best moment to arrest them. Sometimes they think it's inside the courthouse, sometimes they think, and most often it's outside of the courthouse. And so what this legislation would do is ensure that anyone attending court on your way there or leaving is equally protected under this act. Uh, Chair Lanceman. Can you tell me what um, conversations or uh, um, uh, cooperation you've gotten from the different district attorney's offices in, in the, the city uh, in terms of making some of the recommendations happen, uh, as well as just collecting information to put the report together? Yeah, absolutely. Do you want me to do that? Um, so we, I'm just going to sort of lay it on the table. So we have, have had a several several meetings over the last two and a half years, both with district attorney's offices, with the attorney general's office, with the OCA itself, um, and we had meetings with OCA in which OCA said to us, we want to hear about what the district attorney's offices say. We want to hear, we, we want to know what is being said all over the state, right? And we need data, we need information. And so this report, Safeguarding Our Courts, is a response to those meetings with OCA in which they asked for us to get data. So then we went out to the district attorney's offices, which IDP and others had been advocating with for months and months, and said, look, we have this call to action from OCA to, to find data and really show what the effect is and to put into numbers what that chilling effect is, right, which is so hard to prove a negative. And so the district attorney's offices were very responsive to us and were, were willing to provide us the data that you see in this report. Some district attorney's offices didn't have um, their immigrant affairs offices as up and running as others, so their data wasn't as robust as others just because they were newer. But every district attorney's office that we reached out to provided us data that is now contained in this report. So it was a very collaborative effort. I, was, I attended a, um, <clears throat> a press conference, I don't know, a month, six weeks ago, yeah, in support of the Albany legislation. And in attendance were the district attorneys from Bronx, Brooklyn, and Manhattan. Mm -hmm. um, the DA's offices can speak for themselves, but what's your assessment of um, each office's willingness to make the accommodations that they can make to kind of protect immigrants from, from ICE. If you can give us a, a rough scorecard, or maybe you can tell us we really like the fact that Office X is doing this and Office Y is doing that. Um, we have had great success in working with certain district attorney's offices, which are uh, covered in this report, and others, you know, it takes a little more work. Yeah. I'm just going to leave it at that. You might have a career in politics <laughs> with an answer like that. Um, I know our colleagues have questions. Uh, does anybody have questions on the, on the committee side? The advocates? Okay, so the last question before you, before you head out. Um, how, how uh, the, the, administra the administration is about to testify after you. What, what role can the city play in post-bill adoption to really make this happen when we did the research, many of the incidents, uh, while they're statewide, most of them are happening here in our city. And so wh what's the responsibility of the city and the mayor's office to, 
to this, to, to this kind of statewide action at the local level? Sure. I always say this at every meeting, if they arrested less people, the city, then we'd have less of a problem. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yes. it, I think that's part of it, honestly. I say it kind of jokingly, but I'm also saying it seriously. And I know that there have been efforts made by the city to think about things that, you know, where people do not need to be brought into a, a precinct and fingerprinted or where people can be uh, not even issued a summons if it's not necessarily like certain quality of life offenses. So I think that that's something that we definitely uh, support and appreciate. Um, I think that... Uh, Another issue that we have to be sensitive of is like ICE um, receives information from a lot of different places, right? So I think that this is why it's been so important for us to advocate in terms of the detainer advocacy, right? To not have people being brought into the precinct unnecessarily, because even if NYPD doesn't want to do anything, those fingerprints are getting sent to ICE with whatever other data that they're um, uh, ex ex uh, collecting. So I think part of this vision is like to really think about how when we think about making our communities really safer for everybody, like what are the different things that maybe are feeding into this system that ICE is able to so effectively tap into are things that I am, I hope to continue conversations about. And I would also just say, you know, our city partners have been wonderful. Um, all of the city agencies that we reached out to have been really great in working with us. Um, you know, they, they continue to collect their own data and we are eager to continue to partner with them in sort of understanding the impact that this continues to have on our communities. Is any of that data in this report as well? They, my understanding is they'll be testifying about their, the data that they've been collecting. Okay, great. We'll ask about that. Okay, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you very thank much. You. Uh, our next our next panel is the administration, and we're really excited to have Commissioner uh, Mustafi on to to speak with us and and present. We have also been joined by Councilmember Jonai from the Bronx, and I think that's every oh, and Councilmember Eugene from Brooklyn. Commissioner, when you're ready. Oh, we're gonna do an oath. Where is it? Oh, you're gonna just do it, right? <laughs> Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I wanted to begin today by first addressing some comments that were made by council member Yeager uh, several weeks past. Um, as the daughter of Iranian immigrants, my personal experience has often been one in which my family's country of origin my history and experience are blanketly demonized in the press by elected officials and by political discourse that is often removed from the complex reality of my own experience, my understanding, and my identity as an Iranian American, something that has been, in many ways, a lifelong struggle. It's been an honor to serve in my role as Commissioner of the Office of Immigrant Affairs because the very existence of this office and the values driven by this administration have been ones that recognize that every person in our great city of immigrants deserves to be recognized with dignity, with humanity, and with respect for the myriad histories that we bring, including our Palestinian sisters and brothers. That our job is to put forward a vision and a commentary that advances inclusion and justice for all. I wanted to thank the speaker and the chair, Chairman Chaka, of this committee for sharing in this vision for this committee and for taking action to demonstrate that nothing less is acceptable. Now turning to the topic at hand, thank you to Speaker Johnson, Chairman Chaka, and Chair Lansman, and members of the committees on immigration and the justice system. My name is Bita Mustofi. I'm the commissioner for the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. My testimony today addresses federal immigration enforcement activity in and around state courthouses in New York City and the city's deep concern about the impact that this activity has on New Yorkers' access to justice. Though the city does not have jurisdiction to regulate activities in the courts, which are controlled and operated by the state, we do recognize the grave import of this issue. A hallmark of the Trump administration continues to be overbroad immigration enforcement. In New York City and the surrounding region, US ICE has 
dramatically increased arrests of immigrants. In the first full federal fiscal year of the Trump administration, total ICE arrests in the New York City area increased 88% compared to the last full federal fiscal year for the previous administration. Arrests of people with absolutely no criminal convictions increased even more sharply between those two time periods by an alarming 414%. By its own statements and the accounts of a range of stakeholders concurrent with this overall shift, ICE has increased its efforts to conduct enforcement at courthouses in New York City and throughout the state. This degree of enforcement demonstrates a disturbing lack of concern for the devastating human consequences of immigration arrests and the mere threat of encountering an ICE officer in the course of one's daily life on individuals, families, and communities. So does ICE's willingness to conduct these enforcement actions in and around courthouses, which we believe should be designated as sensitive locations. Mayor de Blasio has repeatedly called for ICE to cease overbroad enforcement in our communities, including ICE presence and enforcement in and around courthouses. The city does not, as I noted, have jurisdiction to regulate access to the courts, but has and will continue to advocate for ICE to limit its enforcement actions at the courts. We have raised our concerns directly with ICE and remained engaged with a range of stakeholders on this issue. We recognize that the New York State Office of Court Administration's recent expansion of its court access protocol will help to ensure safety and security in courtrooms and provide for additional data collection and transparency around ICE's activities in and around the courts. We support the goals of the Protect Our Courts Act to limit civil immigration enforcement in and around state-controlled courthouses, and we'll continue to work with our partners in the council, the advocacy community, and colleagues in state government towards a solution that is as strong and protective of access to courts for all New Yorkers, regardless of immigration status, as possible. We also continue to call on the federal government to designate courthouses as sensitive locations. And if ICE will not act to do so, Congress must. The motives of the Trump administration are clear. Time and again, this administration pursues anti-immigrant policies. They claim to do so in the name of public safety, but what we know in New York City is that overbroad enforcement, including ICE presence in and around the courts, only increases the risks for many vulnerable New Yorkers by deterring them from accessing the justice system. The state courts are an essential component of our justice system and as such play a critical role in public safety for individuals and the community as a whole. For the criminal courts to perform their function, it's imperative that victims, witnesses, and defendants are able to fully and fairly participate in the criminal justice process. Whether a person is coming to court to testify as a witness, seek an order of protection, participate in their own defense, or observe a judgment being issued, they must be able to do so without fear that they will be apprehended by federal immigration authorities. Anything short of this risks undermining due process short, and squandering the resources of the system, critically jeopardizing the safety and well-being of victims of crime or abuse. Moreover, the criminal justice system must be able to resolve cases in a way that is fair for victims as well as those facing prosecution. For these reasons, we're concerned by reports that vulnerable New Yorkers, including victims and survivors of domestic and gender-based violence, among others, are staying away from the courts out of fear of ICE enforcement or encounters. In addition, beyond the criminal courts, we're deeply concerned that the fear of potential ICE enforcement at state civil and problem-solving courts could similarly deter immigrant New Yorkers from pursuing or defending their rights or engaging in essential services that they may need. Civil courts such as the Family Court, the Supreme Court, and the Housing Court are important forums for individuals to resolve matters essential to their, well, to their well-being. For example, seeking custody, obtaining an order of protection, or preventing eviction. Problem-solving courts such as the Human Trafficking Intervention Court provide an indispensable opportunity to engage trafficking victims in supportive services, including immigration legal services and culturally appropriate counseling services. It's imperative that these courts be as accessible as possible to New Yorkers who need them, no matter their immigration status. While a 2018 ICE directive instructs officers to generally avoid conducting enforcement actions in courthouse areas dedicated to non-criminal proceedings, 
such as actions not strictly prohibited. Such actions, excuse me, are not strictly prohibited. What is clear is that this distinction does, not, does very little to dispel the community fears that we hear regularly. We are proud that in New York City, our office has, in collaboration with many partners across government and the community, strongly mobilized to combat the Trump administration's actions that have stoked fear among immigrant communities. And our approach is multifaceted. We've worked with the council to ensure that our local laws and policies protect the privacy of and access to services for all New Yorkers and promote sub public safety for all. In New York City, we generally do not and will not use city resources to do ICE's job for them, especially where it is not in the city's public safety interest to do so. Furthermore, the city has strong confidentiality laws and policies that protect the personal information of all New Yorkers who engage with the city. We continue working to strengthen these protections under the leadership of the Mayor's Office of Information Privacy. To help ensure all of our city's residents feel safe accessing services, regardless of immigration status, the city agencies are generally prohibited from permitting non-local law enforcement personnel to access non-public areas of city property. Exceptions are made for when a judicial warrant is presented, exigent circumstances exist, or access is otherwise required by law or to further the mission or purpose of the agency. In addition, Together with our partners in the council, we have increased access to legal help for immigrants by investing at historic levels in legal services and promoting programs such as Action NYC, NY Citizenship, Legal Services for Immigrant Survivors of Domestic Violence, and the New York Immigrant Family Unity Project. These programs provide immigrant New Yorkers with access to a continuum of services that help meet a broad spectrum of legal need from screening and brief advice to deportation defense or other complex forms, of complex forms of representation. The city has dedicated special attention to enhancing access to justice and services for immigrant crime victims. In collaboration with the Mayor's Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence, the Mayor's Office for Criminal Justice, and key city law enforcement agencies, including the NYPD, Administration for Children's Services, the New York City Commission on Human Rights, the Law Department, and the Department of Consumer Affairs, we have successfully cut red tape in the process of requesting law enforcement certifications and declarations for you and T visa applicants. As a result, in 2018, the city continued to see historic levels of U visa certification requests and issuances by our law enforcement agencies. In addition, since 2016, the city has partnered with OCA through the Remote Temporary Order of Protection Project. This project is responsive to state legislation amending the Family Court Act to allow ex electronic filing and appearance, appearances for ex parte family offense petitions when traveling to or appearing in the courthouse would constitute an undue hardship or create a risk of harm to the petitioner. Currently, NDGBV has implemented this remote TOP project in collaboration with OCA at four of the New York City Family Justice Centers, increasing access to family court for survivors of domestic and gender-based violence. Further, in partnership with our sister agencies and community-based organizations, as well as leaders throughout the city, we have worked to affirm immigrant communities in the face of ongoing attempts by the federal government to advance the anti-immigrant policies. We're committed to empowering New Yorkers with timely and trustworthy information about their rights and important immigration-related developments that affect them. Last year, we engaged approximately 18,000 individuals through Know Your Rights events and other outreach efforts and mobilized extensive campaigns around issues of crucial concern to communities, such as the proposed public charge rule change. These efforts have helped immigrant New Yorkers know they're welcome in our city and can access city services. Nonetheless, throughout our work in immigrant communities, we continue to see high levels of fear related to the threat of ICE enforcement. The harsh reality of increased enforcement is also reflected in our own constituent service work, where in 2018, we saw an uptick in requests for legal assistance for those who are detained or under orders of deportation. The persistent fear of ICE enforcement serves to undermine this important work. This threat to the effectiveness of the city's efforts is further evidenced by the harmful impacts of ICE courthouse enforcement, 
observed by service providers. For example, a city contracted legal service provider reported that a client who is a survivor of domestic violence was too afraid to file her order of protection and visitation petition in family court because she believed that ICE would find out about the filing and try to apprehend her. The client heard about a rumored episode in the Bronx in which ICE made an arrest in a courtroom and the client was convinced that this would also happen to her. As is evident in the examples recounted by legal service providers throughout their safeguarding the integrity of our court's report released this morning, this is far from a one-off occurrence. In closing, I'd like to reiterate our deep concern about ICE's activities in the state courthouses and the impact that these actions have on New Yorkers' access to justice. We again call on ICE to limit enforcement in the courthouses and to designate them as sensitive locations. We'll continue to work in partnership with the council, advocates, and colleagues in state government to advance a solution alternatively that protects access to the courts for all New Yorkers, regardless of immigration status, as robustly as possible. We look forward to hearing even more testimony today and continuing to work with our partners on this important issue. Thank you for inviting me to testify. Thank you, Commissioner. And I want to say also thank you for your, for your words uh, in opening. Um, it's, it's just so important that, that your voice is heard. You're a New Yorker. Um, you get the duty and the privilege and the honor to do your work as the commissioner. And our work here is so important for people to hear your story is hopefully a signal that compounds on the signal that we sent, a very serious signal that we are affirming our commitment to every New Yorker, no matter what country they come from, and that every time they look at us from where you're sitting, you're sitting in the chair where so many people come and testify and tell their story, many times without able to even give their full name because of fear. And that we take seriously. Thank you. And I know that it's ha it has been a difficult conversation for us, but it's a conversation that we have to have and we did, and we'll continue to have it. And that's, I'm, I'm kind of signaling to the immigration committee here that we're very serious about that and we won't deter from that commitment. So thank you. Thank you. My, my first question is really for, as an administration, and the lead up to June, the legislative session that's just moved past budget in Albany, how are we gonna land this bill and what's the mayor doing to really put everything that you all have into ensuring that this passes any kind of sense about where we are and how we can kind of work together to make that happen. Yeah, so I'll start by saying that we've been engaged for some time with OCA and other actors to really um, kind of understand uh, what they're seeing, understand what's happening. I think as you heard from the providers, a request had been made for better data to really demonstrate kind of what the experiences are and how to effectively um, ensure that people understood and seriously took the impact of this enforcement. So I think um, we're really grateful for that report. We've, we're continuing conversations with OCA itself, um, who I know has indicated um, through reporting in the last 24 to 48 hours that they're seriously looking at the, the recommendations themselves. Um, and as I noted, o OCA. I'm, yes, yeah. I believe in reporting this morning. Um, and I think um, you know we're we're eager to continue those conversations. And as I noted, support the goals of the bill. So we'll continue to um, speak to the sponsors and ensure that um, we understand what all the possibilities are and where we can see the most robust protections. And, and really, the next question, and this is this is more in terms of. Uh, the accountability that, that I want to have on our side as well, including our speaker and our, our kind of state legislative team that goes up every, every um, what are the conversations that, that you or the mayor are having right now with folks? In ter are, there, are there actual conversations, one-on-ones? You mentioned OCA uh, for kind of data c collection and sharing. Uh, what about the district attorneys and the police department itself? We have had internal conversations with our agencies um, to better understand what we see the impacts to be. I think as you heard um, the uh, providers testify to, and it may have been in your opening remarks as well, 
Um, there was um, evidence of a decrease in foreign-born individuals in the calendar year from 216 to, 2016 to 17 um, accessing the family justice centers. I think um, you know what we're happy to say is that that decrease has um, uh, leveled. It, it's not quite so dramatic, and I can s and say confidently that our partners at NDGVV are taking that very seriously and are looking at where there has been an impact and calibrating their outreach and engagement to address that effectively. Um, and I think some of that obviously can be noted not, you know, on the specific engagement that they've done to try to combat those those fears and concerns, but also broadly what we as a city have done to demonstrate that people should feel confident engaging with our systems. Um, I think equally noteworthy is that while they've seen a dec um, while those numbers demonstrated a decrease in new clients, actually returning foreign-born clients increased their utilization of the family justice centers, which again, I think speaks positively to the experience of folks who are accessing the services and the confidence that they have in the delivery of those. Um, We've talked as well with NYPD and others, the challenges I think you will appreciate in um, effectively understanding impact here is that PD does not ask immigration status um, for individuals who are reporting crimes or serving as witnesses, which we, we uh, affirm is the correct course of action. And so it's been more challenging to try and document or understand if there is a greater impact that they're witnessing. And, and before I hand it over to Chair Lanceman, uh, I, I want to ask a little bit about the discrepancy that I'm, I'm kind of hearing, and, and maybe it's not, but uh, the, the numbers of the UNT visa uh, in the report is saying uh, there's a decrease. Well, we're kind of looking at, from, from the kind of city numbers, that there's an increase. Is right. there, well, what's, the, what, what's the discrepancy here? Yeah, so I think the report is primarily and specifically speaking to requests and issuances that are occurring within the family court context. Um, we, are, uh, we are speaking to requests and issuances um, that are from city law enforcement agencies. So um, I think this has been a, a huge effort on the part of um, Moya and our sister agencies um, in the task force that we hold together to ensure that we're doing everything that we can to increase access to you and T visa certifications. Um, I think you've seen that um, effectively play out in the sheer volume of increase that we've seen over the last couple of years, including, um, again, an increase this year in the number of issued certifications. So it's a stark contrast to the family court system. All the reasons um, I, I'm not personally aware, but um, I think the difference is, or the inconsistency there, is that we're talking about two different issuing agencies. And, and I'm just kind of looking at the data from the NYPD for and the law department, the UNT visas. Your annual report talks about the decrease uh, marginally in 2018 as compared to 2017. And is there is there the qualitative data that explains the decrease? Yeah, it's a pretty nominal decrease in requests, and okay. so... What, what is that? What is that nominal? Um, I can get you the exact number comparatively between each year's, um, but it's, it's, not, um, it's not hugely sig significant, and in fact, I think what you know is that um, we've seen a steady increase every year, and we, we believe that last year was sort of a good reflection of where we are at, and now we might be stabilizing in terms mm -hmm. of the number of requests, but our, we're focused on the number of positive um, grants, which you actually saw an increase in. Okay, I'm gonna hand it over to Chair Lanceman. 20 fewer requests, I'm being 20 told. citywide? <laughs> yes. Got it, thank you for that. <laughs> thank you. So one of the things <clears throat> that the prior panel testified to that would be helpful to protecting immigrants in, uh, from the clutches of ICE would be um, easing up on the prosecution of certain low-level offenses that both require immigrants to come to court in the first place, as well as um, expose them to, to deportation as a basis for yeah. deportation if they were convicted of those offenses. What are your views on that? 
Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, credit to both the council and the administration. We've seen a, a tremendous um, shift in uh, criminal arrests in the issuances of civil summonses, right? I think the number is about 150,000 fewer arrests over the course of the last several years. Um, a shift in the implementation of the Criminal Justice Reform Act to an increase in civil summonses as opposed to criminal summonses. That's been one of the central goals of IDNYC, ensuring that people who don't otherwise need to be arrested are not because they can prove their address um, with their IDNYC when interacting with a law enforcement officer for a low-level offense. Um, I think all of those initiatives are welcome and we you know, hope to continue seeing them realized in even more robust ways. Um, and I think with the implementation, the full implementation of the Criminal Justice Reform Act and an increased move towards um, issuances of civil summonses and sort of vacating old warrants, we'll continue to see um, a, a more equitable sort of system and a people being less, um, required less to go through fingerprinting. I think, um, you know, that is obviously a goal that we share um, and w will hopefully result in even fewer individuals having to go through that process. Well, what are we to make then of the mayor's insistence on continuing to arrest people for marijuana possession, his insistence on continuing to arrest people for fair evasion? Just this week is, insistence on continuing to arrest primarily women, but not exclusively, for um, low-level prostitution offenses? You know, I would say, obviously, the balance that is attempted to be struck by the administration has been one at looking at uh, limiting arrests where necessary while ensuring that we're advancing public safety concerns. I can't speak specifically to those um, decisions. What I can say is, and I hope everybody is aware, that even in those instances, it's not New York City that's um, proactively providing information of that arrest to the federal government. Rather, we're mandated to provide that to the state, which is mandated by the federal government to share that information. Well, no, I, I can't quite let you off the hook there completely, because you're the administration at this hearing. Um, it's the administration, it's the mayor's police department that is making these arrests. Um, almost all of the changes that have resulted in the large-scale reduction of arrests have been the result of this council dragging the mayor, kicking and screaming, and his two police commissioners um, to those conclusions. And I can't let you off the hook either in not addressing those three specific offenses, which we find have a particular impact on the immigrant community. And so, as the voice of the administration on immigration matters, at a hearing where we are discussing um, what we can do in New York City to prevent uh, and make it difficult for ICE to uh, get people uh, at courthouses in the criminal justice system, um, will you go to the mayor and say, Mr. Mayor, we are needlessly exposing people to deportation to ICE by continuing to arrest them for these low-level, nonviolent offenses, specifically marijuana, fare evasion, and prostitution. Um, what I would say is that certainly my office is always interested in understanding impacts that people are seeing and ensuring that we're informing and advising the administration accordingly. Um, and as it relates to these three, open to, to hearing more. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Councilmember Drum. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Good to see you. Thank um, you is it um, the administration's belief that it does not have the legal authority to ensure that ICE does not have access to um, courthouses with, without a warrant? That's correct. And what legal basis is that based on? Um, I think if I could parse maybe your question a little bit, I think it's because the, the um, property is technically owned by the city. Is that what you're asking? Yes, and my next question actually is, d does the state lease that property? Yeah, so our understanding in consultation with our law department, because we have looked into this, um, is that we're essentially mandated by the state to provide the property for the utilization of the courts. 
um, and limited in any functionality of what occurs on that property by state law. So would you know when those leases expire or how often they come up for expiration? Um, I don't know, but as I said again, it's actually state law that governs um, the content of that, that governs what happens within uh, the, the space um, and that the city is in fact mandated to provide it. So we're ha I'm happy to share that information with you um, and that specifically what laws there, those are. So have you ever explored any um, legal action to take um, against the state to not allow ICE to enter those buildings? We have looked into sort of what authority or jurisdiction we have vis-a-vis -vis the property, and as I said, concluded that it's actually state law specifically. Um, thank you, New York uh, Constitution Article um, 6, Section 28, Subsection B, um, that li literally outlines what happens on that property. So. Um, we are essentially superseded, if you will, <laughs> um, by what occurs there, which is why we've engaged in conversation with OCA directly. So there's no way that at least could be drawn up stating that offices other than court uh, officers, New York State court officers, are allowed on the property? That is our understanding, that's correct, that we cannot do that. Okay, and does the administration support the New York Protect Our Courts Act? We definitely, we definitely support the goals of that and we wanna continue to support both um, OCA's own exploration and thinking as well as the, the bill and the legislature's work on it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Trump. Are there any other questions from committee members? Uh, so I have a few more questions that, uh, that really kind of tease out Moya's specific role in this in this kind of run up, just not just to the passing of this piece of legislation, but all the mechanics around how we keep fighting because we're not gonna this this bill, as we've heard, isn't gonna remove ICE. It's just gonna give them a process that allows for everyone to have a fairer opportunity to the, to, to justice. Um, the how how is Moya doing outreach and education planning regarding ICE presence at courthouse? right now, and then really thinking about how you disseminate information, how are you communicating with, with uh, IOI providers, and just kind of give us a sense yeah. about what, what your role in disseminating information and education. Yeah, so thank you for the question. A big part of what we have been trying to do um, as effectively and robustly as possible has been to um, do our own kind of analysis and research where we're able to understand kind of what impacts of federal policies are locally. Um, we have um, increased the level of sort of research and evaluation on that front that we do as an office and with that the issuances of our findings publicly and part of that of course is intended to help inform um, uh, advocates, uh, practitioners, the community at large, and others on what is actually happening. Um, the most recent demonstrative of this particular issue is the ICE enforcement fact sheet um, so that people kind of understand what's happening and, and to the degree possible where. And that's a MOYA document? Yes. Okay. Um, we, do the, we do the analyses, we produce it, and we release it. It's the second one now that we've done. Um, is that a public document or is that to the providers only? It's public. Okay. Um, so we've made it public. We intentionally share it with providers. Um, we put it on our website um, and our, our teams as well as organizations that we fund through legal services or know your rights work receive it so that they understand and can effectively communicate with um, community members or others as they're looking at either advocacy or just community outreach and information sharing which is so important particularly to dispel some myths and concerns around what is happening where to ensure that people um, are able both to determine for themselves 
what, what makes sense in terms of follow-up, but also how they can access advice from legal service providers in the event that they do have to go to a court, right? Or in the event that they might have an old order of deportation, recognizing that there is this dramatic increase in enforcement. So um, that's been a big part of what we've done, is um, ensuring that we're producing this kind of work. Obviously, staying in close contact with providers like um, IDP and Bronx Legal Services, who you just heard testify as they were um, working on their report, um, making sure that we are internally, as I noted, we're trying to figure out what we're seeing in terms of chilling and impact, um, and then, you know, thinking through, and we're all, always um, wanting to hear how we can do better in this regard, but thinking through how we best share that information uh, across communities or where there might be gaps so that we can address them. I will again reiterate that that's not just Moya doing that, but in partnership with sister agencies who we work very closely with on these issues, like NDGBV, right, they're looking at their own data to sort of understand the impact and calibrate effectively the response that they need to have from an outreach front, and we work with them on that on those issues as well. Thank you for that, and we're, we're kind of looking some of that up now. I might, I might have some follow-up questions about the links, or if your team can send those links over, that, sure. that'd be great. I think what, what's also interesting, or uh, we're interested in learning more about any Im immigrant info desks mm -hmm. that may be in, or kind of pop-up style things, yeah. uh, in response to some of the hot spots uh, in the courthouses. Uh, is that a strategy that you're employing right now? So I think, as you know, this was um, a joint administration and council funded initiative uh, about a, a fiscal year cycle ago. Um, and we were really happy with and believed that this was an important um, in, in addition to the work that we're doing in ensuring communities have access to us for a number of reasons. One, immigrant communities may be less readily inclined, of course, to engage with agencies or other actors who um, maybe they don't know they can receive language access in their, in their languages or they might already be in a community setting. Um, and so we have since that time maintained um, through in-kind dollars the uh, immer uh, info desks at three locations, Coney Island Hospital, the Flushing Library, and Metropolitan uh, Coney Island, not hospital, Coney Island um, HRA uh, Center, uh, Metropolitan Hospital, and Flushing Library. And I think I'm, what I'm happy to say that that does as a addition to the broader kind of outreach and community engagement is it provides sort of an in-person support city representative that can really help somebody navigate any issue or concern that they have. The number one issue that we hear through those desks is immigration legal services or questions. Um, so I think we recognize the ongoing. And just to pause you there, yeah. uh, just to clear, clear that up, those are the three sites that you are currently building out these desks. These are at HRA locations. Those are the three sites where we currently operate. So they're not HRA locations. They're the Coney Island is an HRA location. Flushing is the library. That's the library. Okay. And Metropolitan is the H and H Hospital. H and H Hospital. Yes. Okay. And and I guess I'm asking more about courts specifically, and if there's a presence like a desk there, that's well, do you have any presence that has that kind of function at at a court as as you're overlaying the, the need for, uh, for the kind of ICE engagement and what Moya can be doing to really connect folks to information and, and access to lawyers or whatever they might need. Yeah, I mean, certainly something we would be interested in exploring. What we've done is co-located this with additional services, um, specifically with uh, locations where we have IDNYC enrollment. Um, as a way to ensure that we're, we're meeting people where they're at, right? We're meeting communities where they're at. And I think, um, you know, what we've heard from providers and I think is evident through some of the reporting is a lot of the issues with the court setting is really communication with people before they even get to the courts. So, um, you know, there might be different things to consider in terms of whether or not that's the right location for us to be in. 
Yeah, I, I think that's the right question. And, uh, and we'll ask our advocates actually to tell us a little bit more about what they think is, 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 is important. Um, the, the stuff that we just looked up online, the fact sheet is, is we think broadly about ICE enforcement in, in, in NYC, not necessarily the courthouses. Yeah. Is there something that's more connected to courthouse activity? There's nothing that's more connected to courthouse activity. If I'm recalling correctly, the fact sheet speaks to an increase in arrests at courthouses. Um, and then the specifics of the impact, as I noted, has been more challenging from the agency level, which is why you know, we've also uh, been interested in receiving the advocates report to better understand what they're seeing kind of uh, with, with greater data and clarity. Okay. Um, Let's move to the information that you're getting on ICE sightings. How are you receiving that from the public uh, at or near courthouses, specifically from, from the public? Yeah. And, and what, what are you doing to kind of aggregate that information? Is that, is that also available public? It, this is all kind of connected to this idea of, of information. What we saw is not specific, but are you collecting data? Is there a hotline? Are people calling you? How are you taking that data? Yeah, so in terms of, um, court access, folks are generally calling the IDP hotline, and that is actually, I think, where people should be calling because they have been serving as the right repository for receiving this information, and that's one of the areas that they've functioned as an agency, be, you know, pre this, um, pre this uh, moment in time with the federal administration. Um, and so it's very important, I think, for us to maintain that line of communication. There have been, in, we are obviously interested in understanding what's happening, um, but people are not coming to us directly, if you will, at every time they sort of see a nice agency, agent or enti entity conducting an enforcement action. We're hearing from our legal service providers what they're seeing, of course. Um, but the most sort of systematic um, kind of compilation of kind of immediate reporting and understanding if, is more readily going through IDP. Is that, is that an official policy that we can, we can kind of amplify? Call IDP hotline. If yeah, you see and, I, and I is is what we both through our Know Your Rights forums as well as um, through legal service providers. It's one of the resources that we ensure people know exists and have. Okay, um, I think I think that we. I'd like a commitment that Moya, and we can talk about that later, so we can kind of get through some of the other questions um, that Moya really commits to to doing outreach and specifically in communities that are impacted uh, in, in relationship to courthouses. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that they're gonna wanna hear from us uh, as a city on that, on that front and, and work in partnership with the advocates on the ground. But is, is that something that you can commit to today that we can figure out how we communicate that information? Uh, because we're communicating a lot of different things. All the, the work that we're doing through Action NYC and the key to the city, we're, we're in spaces that are really designed by us as yep. a city. And, and I think that, that there needs to be a little bit more, more commitment to, to that. And we're, we're hoping that this law passes, of course, and then there's gonna be implementation and, and really working with your, all of our relationships with the courts. Uh, and can, can, we, can we commit to that together? Yeah, I mean, always if there are, are um, kind of specific ideas or strategies on where we can ensure that we're, we're better in providing increased, better information or where information needs to be provided more directly, we absolutely wanna hear that and commit to doing that. I think, as I noted, where we've been able to most tangibly understand that has been within the, the FJC context and that, the, that learning has already been adapted and is considered in what outreach happens by that office. So that is already happening in that setting and then more broadly in terms of communities understanding what is happening in the city, both in terms of enforcement at courts and more broadly is incorporated in everything that we do from an outreach perspective as well as programming and legal service provision. Got it, okay. And there's more, I think, on the budget side that we can think about in really creating uh, a resource gap question or filling the resource sure. gap in getting resources to courts, yep. especially as we're gonna see this ramp up. 
more and more. Beyond the Knife Up expansion for more lawyers and whatnot. Okay, so the, in accordance to the raise the age legislation, the law department is now regularly sending attorneys to night court. We understand. And has Moya briefed the law department on ICE operations in our courts? Yes. Yes. Um, and would Moya be amenable to developing an action plan with the law department as a precaution should ICE interfere in the city's administration of justice? Sorry, can you repeat your question? Would, would Moya, would you be amenable to developing an action plan uh, with the law department as a precaution should ICE interfere in the city's administration of justice? I think I would need to, I would certainly be open to talking to the law department and understanding what that might look like um, and thinking about how the city might be best responsive in that context, yes. And I think what's, what's well, okay, I think that if you want to expand on that and what that might look like from your frame, uh, the law department will have a kind of big component to that, but uh, we want to follow up on that Sure. immediately and kind of get a sense about what that can look like. Um, what coordination exists between Moya and the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice in relationship to monitoring and responding to immigration enforcement? Um, MockJ has been a partner with us on this um, and in both engaging OCA as well as thinking about kind of more broadly um, all of the impacts around enforcement to our communities and um, you know, we certainly welcome that partnership and they will continue to be a key agency that's at the table with us as we're looking at doing this work. Okay, so I think we're gonna, we're gonna pause there uh, and we really wanna follow up soon and really work in tandem with your team at the office and the, and the council as, as we advocate together in Albany to land this before the end of the legislative session. Sounds good, thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Any questions? No, you're good, okay. We're gonna pick up our next uh, panel. And panel number two, Sorry. panel number three, we're at number three, is the Bronx Defenders of Rosa Cohen Cruz, Brooklyn Defender Services, Richard Bailey, Legal Aid Society, Jill Waldman, and the Anti-Defamation League, Evan Bernstein. Okay, who would like to begin? Let's begin over here with you. Make sure that the mic is on and it's near you. Well, good afternoon, thank you for having me. My name is Richard Bailey. I am a supervising attorney in the Padilla practice of the Immigration Unit at Brooklyn Defender Services. I'd first like to thank uh, City Council uh, Committees on Immigration and the Justice System, and in particular, uh, Chairpersons uh, Menchaca and Lansman for having us today and for giving me this opportunity to testify uh, about the impact of immigration and customs enforcement having a presence in the New York City court system. Brooklyn Defender Services is one of the largest legal service providers in New York City, representing approximately 30,000 low-income Brooklyn residents each year uh, who are arrested facing child welfare allegations or challenging deportation. Since 2009, Brooklyn Defender Services has counseled, advised, or represented more than 10,000 immigrant clients, and um, about a quarter of Brooklyn Defender Services criminal defense clients are foreign-born, roughly half of whom are not naturalized citizens and are therefore at risk of deportation or other disproportionate collateral consequences as a result of their criminal case. Our Padilla unit advises uh, BDS's criminal defense attorneys and their non-citizen clients on the immigration consequences of guilty pleas and different trial outcomes to help them avoid or minimize negative immigration consequences. Since we last testified about the ICE presence and, and arrests in courts, arrests in and around New York City courthouses have increased 1,700% uh, according to the Immigrant Defense Project report. The majority of people 
caught up in this wave of enforcement were reporting to court on low-level offenses, including many traffic violations. Since the beginning of 2019 alone, Brooklyn Defender Services has had more than 18 clients arrested by ICE in or outside the courthouse or in the community because of pending criminal allegations, mostly misdemeanors. Can I, can I pause you there really quick? Two, two quick things uh, operations-wise. One is we're going to put the clock uh, for two minutes. If you can focus your remarks on anything that would be great to add to the conversation, we're going to read everything. And then we want to focus on some Q&A to kind of really kind of get some of the, some of the pieces out that are going to help us make the case and, and get everything out. Is that, is that good? Yes. And then so Sergeant of Arms, two minute clock. Thank you. You may continue. Okay, I'll, I'll keep it well below that now. Um, so I, I wanted to take a minute then and, and just uh, talk about one client, one recent arrest outside of the court. Uh, uh, about a month ago or so, uh, one of our clients was leaving the Brooklyn Criminal Court at 120 Skimmerhorn and uh, was with her attorney and uh, two men grabbed her on the street outside of the courthouse. She uh, did not know who they were, they did not identify themselves, and given her history of trauma, uh, it was a, a very problematic way to interact with her. Um, she grabbed for her attorney and in the middle of that kind of scuffle, the uh, the officers identified themselves as ICE agents and, um, and finally produced a badge. But, but the entire experience was, you know, understandably very traumatizing for her. Um, so for that reason, uh, you know, for the, the clients that we've seen impacted by this, uh, Brooklyn Defender Services strongly supports uh, the Protect Our Courts Act and um, we, we believe that it would place significant restrictions on civil arrests of those attending or traveling to or from court. And um, we, we have seen that ICE's courthouse arrests have undermined our clients' fundamental rights to have their fair day in court. Um, in addition to the proposed resolution uh, here at the City Council, we call on the Council to consider the following campaigns that would limit immigrant New Yorkers' contact with the criminal legal system. Um, in our written testimony, we offer uh, some recommendations, but that includes ending arrests of human trafficking victims and decriminalizing sex work, providing equal access to driver's licenses for all, and supporting the legalization and regulation of marijuana access. Thank you for considering my comments, and I'd be happy to answer any questions later. Thank you. My name is Jill Waldman. I'm a criminal immigration attorney at the Immigration Law Unit of the Legal Aid Society. Um, I've been at Legal Aid since 2007. And since 2016, I have seen a significant change in ICE enforcement and in the way that uh, clients and attorneys alike um, approach uh, immigration and, and uh, appearances in court. Um, I've seen ICE arrest, among others, uh, clients who are sole providers for young children, clients who have no criminal record, who are pleading guilty to traffic violations, and who are appearing in human trafficking parts. ICE's aggressive, public, and seemingly indiscriminate enforcement in court is dramatic and alarming to legal aid client attorneys and clients alike. Um, because immigration law is complex and ever-changing, even defendants who are not removable from the United States often fear coming to court due to ICE's presence. Non-citizen defendants frequently feel pressured to take unfavorable pleas rather than fight their cases in court um, for fear that repeated court appearances will expose them to apprehension by ICE. Non-citizens will so, um, sometimes forego re rehabilitative programs such as drug and alcohol treatment in favor of jail time for the same reasons. Attorneys now balance the risk of apprehension um, in court against the strength of their clients' cases. Um, Finally, defendants are often apprehended prior to court appearances and are unable to communicate with their attorneys. As a result, judges will issue warrants, thinking that clients have intentionally missed their court dates. This disadvantages clients both in their criminal cases, as it interferes with speedy trial calculations, and leaves the non-citizen with unresolved cases and active warrants when they appear before the immigration judges, 
these non-citizens are then very likely to face prejudice in immigration courts, especially in bond proceedings due to their unresolved cases. Thank you. I have some questions for you after. Okay. after. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Rosa Cohen Cruz, and I'm a Padilla supervisor in the immigration practice at the Bronx Defenders. And in this role, I oversee the practice of advising non-citizen defendants on the immigration consequences of their cases. Um, I also want to focus on kind of three main ways that the Protect Our Courts Act will improve our clients' abilities to defend themselves. Um, first, right now, in the current climate, our clients are accepting unfavorable plea deals to avoid coming back to courts. Uh, second, open cases uh, un end up creating delay and disruption to immigration court proceedings. And third, we've seen ICE disregard our clients' rights in making their arrests. As far as ICE arrests in courts creating bad case resolutions, uh, we do have to advise our clients on the risk of ICE arrests when considering whether to take a plea or go to trial. Because of this, we've had clients who were likely to win at trial but pled guilty. We've had clients who had no prior criminal record and decided to resolve their case with a misdemeanor at arraignments because even when a non-criminal violation would have been likely at a later court date, we've had clients even accept a plea offer that resulted in the loss of future eligibility for status or relief from deportation because of the fear of ICE apprehension in court. Um, some clients have, as stated, chosen to accept incarceratory sentences instead of um, rehabilitative programs as part of their plea because they knew that going to jail would give them a time limit before having to, before they would be able to see their families again, whereas showing up to court at a compliance date could result in an indefinite detention until their deportation. Um, so the Protect Our Courts Act addresses this because it gives clients the security to come to court knowing that they will not be arrested by ICE without um, process, without a judicial warrant, and it messages that all New Yorkers deserve to feel that the courthouse is a safe space to focus on these actually life-altering decisions. Um, is that my time? Wow. Do you want to you finish up with another? I did have just, I just wanted to um, talk quickly about what I've personally witnessed. I've witnessed several of my own clients get arrested in court. In one case, a client of mine was, while we were actually within the halls of, uh, within the halls of justice in the Bronx, and a client who was completely complying was, um, and we, was in mid-conversation with me as his attorney, was uh, pressed up against the glass doors by several ICE officers and violently uh, removed from me. We both asked to speak to each other, me and his counsel, and he was just quickly rushed into a car and driven off. Um, it was extremely horrifying for both of us. His young children were there and watched this happen. Um, in another case, I had to facilitate an opportunity for my client to hug his young children goodbye in the court while ICE off before ICE officers could arrest him and take him away. Um, and just last week, I had another client arrested who was being offered a 24020, a disorderly conduct violation, in court that day, and he was arrested before he was able to take that violation. And now we know that because he has an open case, when he appear, appears for a bond hearing in a few weeks, he's more likely to be denied, even though that case is going to resolve with a non-criminal case resolution. So these are the kinds of things that we are dealing with every day in the court, and the Protect Our Courts Act addresses each of these issues um, and improves our ability to do our jobs and ze zealously represent our clients for their for the best outcomes. And thank you for sharing that, that testimony as well. Thank you. Thank you, Co-Chair Manchaka and Co-Chair uh, Councilmember Lanceman for having us today on such an important topic. Um, my name is Evan Bernstein, and as a Regional Director of the ADL's New York, New Jersey office, it's an honor to be here today to support uh, a New York City resolution calling for the state legislation passed the governor to sign the Protect Our Courts Act. Uh, since 1913, the mission of the ADL has been to stop the defamation of the Jewish people and secure justice and fair treatment for all, and that's why we're a proud member of the Ice Out of Courts Coalition here in New York. We remain extremely alarmed by the dramatic escalation in ICE enforcement in and around New York courthouses. Indeed, since, 19, and since 2016, the Immigration Defense Project, IDP, has documented over 1,700 increase, percent increase in ICE operations in the courthouses throughout the state. This has had a chilling effect on the reporting of crime and the ability for victims and witnesses to access our justice system. Immigrants who are already reluctant to interact with law enforcement in a current political climate are even more afraid to come forward to report crime and seek assistance. This means domestic violence survivors aren't getting 
orders of protection. Tenants aren't bringing complaints to the abusive landlords and victims of violent crimes, including hate crimes, are denied their fair day in court. Compounding the issue even further, we know that non-citizens are more likely to be the victims of crime relative to their U.S.-born counterparts, and that immigrants are particularly susceptible to crimes that prey on the vulnerable, uh, vulnerable statuses. By the way of example, FBI data from 2017 revealed a 24% annual increase in hate crimes attacks against Latin, the Latin, Latinx community, a Latino community, and community already targeted of significant anti-immigrant bigotry. When victims or witnesses are reluctant to come forward out of fear of deportation or other immigrant-related repercussions, perpetrators are more likely to escape the justice system without consequence. Crimes increase when perpetrators have nothing to fear. The vicious cycle makes it that much more difficult, if not impossible, for local police to rebuild the bonds of trust, cooperation within immigrant communities. This compromises the safety and security for all of us. The Protect Our Courts Act is critical to disrupting these trends. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you all for being here. I have some follow-up questions, and then I'll hand it over to uh, Chair Lanceman for any questions that he might have. Um, I'm, so one, I just want to um, acknowledge that the, the that traumatic experience that's happening in the courts isn't just happening to the person being taken away in a car, be it a young young child or a father. It's also the family that's there. It's also for all the other families that are there watching this to happen, maybe immigrant, non-immigrant. And then it's for the lawyers that have taken on a, a, a pledge to defend your client. And, and I think that's, that's, the, that's the kind of nature of what's, what's happening here and the fabric that is being um, destroyed in our justice system. And so I just want to say thank you for, for offering that piece because I think that's an important thing to talk about for folks that are not ever going to go into a courtroom, but we're going to need on our side to push this and make it make it clear to our elected officials. And so I want to say thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, the other the other kind of point to this is um, from the, the IDP and the Bronx Legal Services report, it sounds like the ICE has been found in problem-solving courts. Uh, you're reporting some of that now. And providers of of court mandated community service. Have you found that this has resulted in fewer pleas? And I think you, you spoke about you spoke about that in your testimony that involved community service or treatment. And has that meant that clients with immigration status issues generally cannot take pleas that involve treatment? And can you talk a little bit more about how that actually happens and and give us a, a, a kind of deeper flavor of that? Any, no, no, if, if um, one of you have a... Well, one piece is that when clients are sentenced to program and rehabilitative um, programs as part of their plea, they have to come back to court to demonstrate compliance. So it's that fear of you know, coming back and showing that they've been cooperating and doing what uh, the court had asked them to do, that at each court date, ICE could be there waiting for them, regardless of how successful they've been in the program. Um, and so you know, when considering that, it is logical to think that you will have a better chance. You, you know if you're going to take a jail sentence of you know, 30 days, that after 30 days, you'll go and see your family again. But if you have, a, have to come back to a compliance state and ICE could be there one day to arrest you, you never know if you'll see your family again after that. And that, it's a logical decision that our clients are making. I, I agree with that. And I would also say that even um, things like paying fines or doing community service, showing proof of community service or uh, DWI compliance, um, I get calls daily about of clients who are concerned about even going to uh, compliance parts and fear that uh, ICE will be waiting for them there. And, and so those are the pleas. What about, what about a sense of public safety and essentially the ICE operations has essentially had a chilling effect and people are less likely to report crimes? How are you seeing that from any one of your organizations? So we do a lot of work with, uh, with the, consul the consulates in, in New York, especially the Mexican consul. We have a memorandum of understanding. We're actually, the ADL is working with uh, local law enforcement to train officials in the consulates on how to handle these hate crimes because the consulates have become the, the call instead of the police for that exact reason. They're so fearful of making those calls to the law enforcement. Uh, we're trying to break those barriers down here. You know, in New York City, police is different than other policing systems throughout New York State. 
Uh, the challenges that we're hearing from consulate members is that uh, they're just total underreporting. So we especially have from the domestic violence component where people are not, uh, they're, they're be women are being assaulted uh, by their partner or spouse and there's such a fear, there's absolutely no phone call being made so children are actually witnessing this. W the women are not able to, to leave their home situation. They're not able to get the kind of treatment that they need or the protection that they need out of the fear uh, because of what's happening with ICE. So they're not even getting to the point of where uh, they're, they're even engaging with the local police, and, and that's something we're seeing, and it's, it's incredibly disturbing, and hearing specifically from the consulates. Thank you for that, and I, and I know that the, I know about this, the ADL and the Mexican consulate work, and I just wanna say thank you and your entire team for, for that work. We were out at Union Square last year to do uh, leafletting, and, and the person that committed the hate crime was found, and, and it was all part of our, our work together, so thank you, thank you for that. Um, anyone else want to kind of comment on that on that piece? Because I think the the next piece is really thinking about how how the city, from your perspective, and this is this is I want to ask this consistent question to all the panels: What can the city do? From your perspective, I asked the the commissioner, can we be in the courts? And she's open to thinking about that. And we're gonna we're gonna work with uh, with Moya and all the agencies to figure out what works. But you're you're the practitioners on the ground. You're seeing this. You're seeing you're seeing the impacts. How how can you invite us into these spaces from your perspective? Think big, and we'll start from there. And think vision, but that's where we're, that's the kind of information we're going to want here. We're in the middle of a budget process right now. We're uh, both Councilmember Lansman and I are on the budget negotiating team, and. And now is the time to understand what we need to do in this crisis moment. Well, when, in addition to um, asking the state legislature to pass and the governor to sign the Protect Our Courts Act, the report what is um, asking the uh, Office of Court Administration to pass their own rules and um, to the extent that the city can, you know, ask, can echo us in this ask, that's extremely important. Um, it is a it is a two-pronged approach and having the court itself speak out and make that, um, designate themselves as a safe space and make those rules uh, messages to the immigrant community of New York that it is not a place where they need to fear immigration enforcement and that's extremely important. So, you know, I urge you to, to pressure the court administration as well. So you got that and you'll, you'll, you'll continue to get that. And what else in terms of presence? To, to, do our agencies need to be in the space? Do they need to be in there? Do they need to have something there? Is there, this is, and, and if you don't have an answer now, come back to us if you think about it, how we can support with resources. That, we're not Congress, we're not the federal government, we're not, we're not able to change those laws, but we are able to offer opportunities. And so much of that is in funding, making sure that you all are funded to go into these courts and do the work. But if there's anything else, now now is the time to talk and and present. And so if you can if you can come back to us, that'd be great. If you have anything now to, to share, I I'd love to hear it. I would say that if hopefully the Protect Our Courts Act is passed, that there be um, a widely a wide public information campaign that people um, in immigrant communities, obviously in different languages, are made aware of the fact that this that a warrant is required for ICE to enter in the courthouses, and so that. Um, people throughout New York City are aware that this is a safe space and what is going on and that they are protected. That's a great, that's a good idea, a public awareness campaign. And you heard the commissioner talk about our, our collaboration, the law, the local law that we passed that really kind of sets that standard on our city property uh, with city information. And so we can, we can kind of put all that together and say this is how we're protecting your rights, uh, your privacy and your, your connection to justice through these courts. Um, The, to, to varying degrees, some of the city's district attorneys have been outspoken about the detrimental effects of ICE in the state courthouses. Have you found that the DAs are uh, receptive to immigration issues and other aspects of your practices, like immigration safe plea deals, for example, uh, across the board citywide? Is that, what's that all, what's, what's, what's happening there? I could speak to our experience in, in Brooklyn. Uh, we have been very grateful to uh, work with the, the Brooklyn DA on um, negotiating pleas that will mitigate or, or reduce potential immigration consequences for our clients. 
of course, there's room for improvement, but we have had a very positive experience with that. And, um, you know, I think there are probably other steps that could be taken with law enforcement, uh, just to go to your previous question in terms of reducing the number of arrests and definitively ending broken windows policing in the city. Um, and that would have a, a downstream effect on the exposure that our clients face when entering into plea agreements uh, with the district attorney's office. Our experience so far with the DAs have been excellent, uh, especially uh, DA. across the board. Uh, the, again, in the spaces that we're in, sometimes we're, it's not always, we're not always leading necessarily with ICE and courts. We're leading with other hate crimes issues, other issues that are taking place in the community based on the, kind of the broadness of our, of our mission. Certainly when we're in those spaces, we are having those conversations, and the, the conversations I've had have been very receptive with the, the DAs that I've met with. Going back to the last part, I think one thing that would be very helpful, if it's possible, is to work with uh, the NYPD. I think we've had great partnership uh, with the work with especially the Hate Crimes Task Force in partnership, and I think is, if there's a way for there to be, a, particularly what was said, like a marketing campaign to help with under, you know, people understanding that NYPD, especially Hate Crimes Task Force, is doing everything in their power to try to be a real, uh, a real partner in this. I mean, even in the trainings we have, they're giving out their cell phone number. They're making this very personal. So I think that there is sometimes misnomers about what the police are, are doing, and I think there's an opportunity there maybe to, to try to educate and, and try to show a more formal partnership. Uh, for the, especially the, the pieces of the department that are, that are actively uh, trying to work on this issue. Thank you for that. And, and maybe the, the, the next question, the final question is, I, I kind of want to hear the operational response to the law itself that you're here supporting with us. Once it passes, how, how do you see and what's your expectation of the mechanics of the courtroom and how it works? And do you have a sense about that and are you getting ready for that and can you present any sense of some examples of how things will change on the ground in the court offices that we can we can kind of hear directly. I think one thing is that the law, um, the law enables the judges to make some of their own rules to um, ensure clients' presence at courts when they are taken into ICE custody. And so this issue that we've been seeing, particularly with um, people being denied bond because they're not able to come back to court and resolve their cases, I think will be more easily addressed by empowering judges to kind of uh, enforce clients' presence in their courtrooms and resolve cases. Um, uh, you know, just requiring the judicial warrant and requiring the process also is extremely important. I mean, one really concrete way that we th see things play out is our clients get arrested in court ICE, you know, they have a picture of our clients, they're kind of looking for them, they don't really know who they are. Sometimes they'll just yell out their name and grab them, and then after separating from them from their attorney, regardless of whether we've invoked their right to counsel and their right to remain silent, they're questioned between the ride from the courthouse to 26 Federal Plaza, and those statements are then used to prove their alienage in their immigration proceedings. So having this law that, you know, is on the books to prohibit ICE from arresting people in court and to provide more um, due process in getting a warrant will actually make immigration advocates more able to then go into immigration court and terminate those cases where admissions to alienage were unlawfully procured. So it could be a very concrete result for, for many immigrants who may end up being arrested um, and if, they're, and if they end up being arrested in violation of this law. Can you walk me through the presentation of, a, of the judicial warrant and like the process that you would imagine an ICE agent if they actually had a, a warrant and what they would do after this law if they didn't have a warrant and what would change and maybe nothing would change except for your ability, ability to build a case like you just mentioned, but does that change at all? You know, I imagine that they would have to have more substantial proof that somebody is um, deportable when they arrest them and a lot of the time they don't like I said a lot of the time the proof that they get about our clients immigration status comes through these the, through questioning them when an undocumented person enters the country they don't always have um, there's not always other evidence until they are questioned outside of the presence of counsel and you know as I've just described so I think that cre uh, requiring more process can really um, inhibit ICE's ability to arrest our clients in the court when they don't have proof of their immigration status. Okay. And any other items? I'm going to hand it to, counsel, uh, to Chair Lanceman.
Thank you. I'm just curious, um, from Bronx Defenders, Brooklyn Defenders, and, and Legal Aid, do you, um, have you seen any uh, uh, impact as a result of the, the Court of Appeals decision giving, um, uh, I'll say, just to simplify, giving, giving immigrants the right to a uh, jury trial in B misdemeanor cases? Um, and uh, is, are you seeing any change in plea conversations as a result of that? It's a very specific question, and if you don't know, that's okay. But, and I know you're not, if I'm not mistaken, you're not doing the hands-on criminal work, um, but. Um, we, we have, I mean, uh, in, sorry. Um, by and large, uh, we see it mostly in uh, DWI cases um, and also um, forcible touching cases that those are uh, often reduced for, uh, to, to um, bench trials and that's uh, not happening anymore. Um, we have had some problems of um, DA saying, well, if you don't consent to this, uh, to a bench trial, then we're not going to reduce, and then the person will still be charged with the A misdemeanor and um, increase their exposure to jail time. Um, but I'd say that by and large, uh, district attorneys are consenting to, um, to jury trials, which is wonderful for uh, our clients. Um, and. Uh, we have seen some pushback in terms of requiring motions or hearings, but in general, it's been a very positive development. Well, and I, I want to hear from the, the others if you have anything to add, but, but the, the part of that that I'm really interested in is, are they um, uh, holding cases, are they, are they um, using as, as leverage the fact that they don't want to submit to a jury trial, mm -hmm. and keeping keeping that, you know, as a higher level of, of offense. That's that's what I'm, I'm interested in. I, I haven't seen that very often. Um, it's a very new decision, so I think we still have yet to see how it's going to play out. And it's also very um, borough specific. It's also very um, district attorney spe um, specific. Assistant assistant district attorney specific. Um, I, I've seen it in a few cases, um, but it's not a widespread practice uh, now. I would, I would echo that. I think um, the Suazo decision, you know, has created some incentive to um, to resolve cases in more favorable ways, um, so that uh, uh, DAs will not have to face jury trials and to offer to offer non-criminal violations um, rather than go to trial on misdemeanors. So there have been some positive um, positive uh, plea resolutions as a result, I would say. My understanding at, at Brooklyn Defender Services is that we are still monitoring to see what the impact of the Suazo decision is. And um, I, would be, I would have to speak with the criminal defense practice to get more information about what they've been seeing. I'd be happy to get that information And, and do you know, uh, is, are your offices in any kind of conversations with the district attorneys about limiting the number of times that a, that a defendant has to appear in person at a hearing to try to limit, uh, limit the number of times that they're exposed to ICE at the courthouse? I don't know that we are, but I certainly think faster case resolutions and any pressure on DA's offices to help resolve cases sooner is something to address uh, your, your previous question about that the city could do to help um, address this issue, especially before the act is passed. I believe that on an individualized basis, we are, uh, our criminal defense attorneys are asking the assistant district attorneys to consent to setting a, a hearing past the speedy trial dismissal date if they know they won't be um, converting the case and, and being able to move forward with it. And I, my understanding is that that has been successful on, on some cases. Um, it reduces the, the amount of exposure that our clients do have in, in coming back to court. Um, but again, that's uh, case by case. Got it. Um, just mentioned that we've been joined by council member Eric Ulrich from Queens. Do you think that there there is room for some kind of systematic uh, approach that limits 
the number of times that defendants have to appear in court compared to, 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 to where we are today. So something less than just an ad hoc basis. I, I'm looking for some guidance on, on what we should expend our political governmental capital on trying right. to get mean, the cases, system to do. In cases where um, a case is unconverted, which means there's no state, a misdemeanor case is unconverted, and there's no state. Can you speak into the mic? Sure, I just want to make sure we record all this. Um, <laughs> it, where a case is unconverted and um, it doesn't look like it's going to be converted, uh, being able to adjourn the case past the what we call the 3030 date, the speedy trial dismissal date, would be extraordinarily helpful because usually there's a series of appearances where the client has to come to court um, just to adjourn the case um, and wait for it to be dismissed. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Co-Chair Lansman, and I want to say just thank you. We're, we're done for this panel, and uh, keep fighting the good fight. The work is not done on the on the legislative side. The, hopefully, that will help alleviate issues. And take care of yourselves and your heart, and just keep fighting. We're with it with you. Thank you. Thank you. We have uh, two more panels, three more panels, nine more folks that want to testify today, and we want to make sure we get to everyone. Uh, Her Justice, Suzanne Saul, Urban Justice Center, Atosa Amovahedi. Yvonne Chen from the Sanctuary for Families, uh, Shani Ades, New York Legal Assistance Group, Naya Lag. Thank you for your patience. We're going to put the two-minute clocks like we did and then really focus on Q&A so we can dig deeper. And if you can give us your testimony, we have it, we'll read it. And if there's any way that you can focus on items that have not been told that can help push the conversation forward, that'd be great and especially for the record to make sure that we hear that you are in support of the resolution as well. Thank you. And we can start over here. Good afternoon, my name is Yvonne Chen and I'm the Outreach Manager of the Anti-Trafficking Initiative at Sanctuary for Families. Um, thank you so much and we are so grateful uh, to the Committee on Immigration and its Chair, Councilmember Menchaco, for this opportunity to testify today and for holding a hearing on the critical issue of immigration enforcement agents making arrests in our courthouses. Needless to say, this is, represents a threat to our fundamental constitutional right to due process and is having a disastrous effect on our justice system's ability to serve some of our most vulnerable neighbors. Um, Sanctuary has long prioritized at-risk isolated immigrants, including scores of undocumented individuals and families. As members of this committee know, City Council has supported Sanctuary's work in the, with immigrants in the human trafficking intervention courts. Since 2014, Sanctuary and our pro bono partners have conducted information sessions and intakes for over 1,000 immigrant defendants in Queens and Brooklyn. A significant number of these individuals were either identified as victims of human trafficking or domestic violence, in many cases, both. Many of these immigrant victims choose to enter with representation with Sanctuary and Pro Bono Council, and we are happy to report that a number of them have legal status today as direct result of the HTACs. When defendants meeting with counsel were able to speak freely, perhaps for the first time, their information not only assisted with securing legal status for themselves, but in some cases have led to investigation and prosecution of traffickers. That trust in a safe, confidential environment, however, has been greatly eroded by presence of ICE in state courts. This chilling effect applies to any non-citizen seeking justice through the court system, but the effect on domestic violence and trafficking survivors is especially devastating. Our client, Anna, was identified by defense counsel as a potential trafficking victim. Anna wanted to participate in the program to receive services, but was also too terrified to appear in court or to meet with sanctuary staff in a safe location. She tried many times to overcome her fear to come meet with us, but in the end was paralyzed by the fear of ICE each time and unable to meet. Unfortunately, the fear of detention and deportation, along with misinformation about immigration processes, led her to avoid further participation as well as in-person meetings. She currently has a warrant out for her arrests. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, I want to thank the City Council also and the Committees on Immigration and the Justice System. My name is Susanna Saul. I'm a managing attorney at Her Justice. We're a nonprofit organization that takes a pro bono first approach to free legal services um, for women living in poverty in New York City. 
We train and mentor volunteer lawyers from the city's premier law firms who enable our clients to access the legal system and obtain the justice they so deserve. We practice in the areas of family, matrimonial, and immigration law, and I want to focus my testimony today on the impact that the Protect Our Courts Act has on the clients and pro bono attorneys we work with. We strongly support the Protect Our Courts Act. We believe that this legislation restores the integrity of the court system as a place where pro bono attorneys can confidently assist our clients in seeking life-saving remedies for themselves and their children. Our clients come from all five boroughs of New York City. Approximately 80% are domestic violence survivors, and three quarters of our clients are mothers. 70% of our clients were born abroad. The increase in ICE arrests at civil courts over the last couple of years has created a paralyzing climate of fear for our clients and a cloud of confusion for the pro bono attorneys we work with. Before ICE increased the arrests of people in the civil courts, our staff and pro bono attorneys would encourage their clients to seek help in the courts no matter their immigration status. We could confidently tell our clients and pro bono attorneys that they could access the courts and the protections to which they are legally entitled without any regard to their immigration status. And we've had to shift our advice to our clients and our voluntary, volunteer attorneys um, since these ICE, this, these ICE arrests um, started increasing. And many pro bono attorneys ask us about the risks of ICE arresting their clients in the courts when they show up for court appearances as witnesses in criminal cases or as litigants in family court or Supreme Court cases. And we are not able to give them any assurance. With the Protect Our Courts Act, we can't rule out completely ICE arrests in courts, but we can reassure them that there are protocols in place and that these arrests are more limited in scope and have judicial oversight. So we strongly support this legislation. Thank you. Chairs Menchaca and Lansman, council members and staff, thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Shawnee Adess, and I'm an associate director of the Matrimonial and Family Law Unit at the New York Legal Assistance Group. NILAG's work in family court, Supreme Court, housing courts, and sitting at four of the five family justice centers provide us with an on-the-ground view of the detrimental impact ICE presence in courts has had on the administration of justice and the particularly outsized impact it has had on those most vulnerable, including survivors of domestic violence, trafficking, and youth. We have worked directly with clients who have withdrawn requests for orders of protection, remain married to their abusive spouse out of fear of having to go to court to obtain a divorce, and who have refused to even begin a court faced case, despite being in need of court intervention because of ICE house, courthouse presence. Some of our examples are contained in the written testimony as well as the report that was released today. Never before have we had to, when meet, meeting with a survivor of domestic violence, include in our safety plan with them whether or not it's safe for them to go to court because they're fearing that ICE would be there. We had one specific client who filed for an order of protection. She came to us with marks all over her body when we filed with her that day. And when she served the other side, by the time she realized that she was going to be coming back and her abusive partner was going to be there, in that in-between time, he had posted posters all over the neighborhood where she works saying words to the effect of ICE, an illegal immigrant, works here. And so she immediately asked us, what if he tips off ICE about court? There's a court date. There's a floor. There's a specific place I'm going to be. Is it safe? And she ended up withdrawing her court, withdrawing her court case. The presence of ICE in the courtroom silences immigrant communities. It deprives them of due process under law, and it undermines the sanctity of our court system. We support the Protect Our Courts Act, because while it still allows ICE to engage in lawful enforcement activity, it requires a warrant to court order ensuring a case-by-case -case analysis of each particular immigrant's circumstances, and it will allow legal service providers the ability to counsel our clients as to their in individual risk, ensure judicial oversight, and help allay the chilling effect of ICE in the courthouse. It would also send a strong message that our New York State government believes that our courthouses are open for all and help change the perception that our, our immigrant communities are currently saying to us that they don't believe that's the case. Good afternoon to the council. My name is Atusa Mohedi. I'm the Director of Legal Services and Development at the Urban Justice Center's Domestic Violence Project. Please imagine the following. LGBTQ client, EJ, in court, seeking protection from severe abuse, unaware ICE is in the courtroom. Case is adjourned, again unaware, client is followed by ICE and summarily arrested outside the building. As a direct result of this, today, EJ is on the verge of reconciling with their abuser because an abusive relationship is safer than being targeted by ICE in the courts. 
EJ is one of 60% of our non-US citizen clients facing a wide range of issues. They're complaining witnesses and victim defendants who are in criminal court, petitioners and respondents in family court, tenants in housing court, victims of identity theft, and more. The presence of ICE in our community courts in New York City impacts our ability to effectively help them navigate all of these systems. Ethically, I feel compelled to screen all of our clients for immigration issues before filing in family court. While our program's interdisciplinary team includes immigration attorneys, this is not readily available resource to the 18B panels and to other attorneys. Screening for these issues is no easy feat. It takes time, expertise, and resources. And while the necessity of these screenings is not eliminated with the passing of this legislation, it would enable us to more accurately calculate the risk to our clients in filing. This is an access to justice issue. The public deserves order and reliability within our legal system. The very purpose of this bill is to ensure smoother access to justice. Community courts, such as family court, are often the only means of accessing justice for working poor and indigent families. By the time you're there, you're already desperate. You're often already marginalized, discriminated against, and impoverished. ICE in these courts impacts everybody and impedes access. Like EJ, those seeking help deserve order and reliability rather than panic and instability. For domestic violence clients, while we cannot protect them inevitably from ICE, what we can do is allow them a venue to pursue a tool to protect them from one evil in their lives, their perpetrators. We can promote our legal remedies as one that are real, that they can avail them to without unjustifiable intrusion by the government during that process. At least when they leave the courthouse, they're leaving a little bit more empowered and a little bit more safe. Thank you. Thank you for that and just giving us more context about what's happening on the ground. I, I think what I wanna ask now is hoping w very soon that this law passes what happens in terms of all the work we'll do with communication? Does this change the needle? Is it too late? Is the chilling effect had its impact? Uh, will we see a turn and could we make a difference in people's perception about what's happening? Even with the law as it's written, ICE will still be able to come in, but they'll just have to follow more rules. Will that help change the culture uh, or the, the kind of fear factor for, for our courts? I think so. I think can can you speak? Sure. Uh, yeah. I think that if you look historically, um, a while back, um, <laughs> or not so long ago, but there was a lot of fear with immigrant communities in terms of engaging with our systems, and we did a lot of work with specifically survivors of domestic violence and trafficking and youth to make them feel safe coming forward. And unfortunately, we've lost some of the things that we've gained, that's certain. Um, but there's no reason that we wouldn't be able to hopefully be able to get that back. And what I think uh, the Protect Our Courts Act does is um, it, it sends a message, and it sends a real powerful message that can hopefully change this perception. There's a perception amongst immigrant communities, right? You see ICE just wandering freely in the courthouse, or you hear about that from your friend was, that was just in court. And then there's the perception, is the court working with ICE? Is the court going to report me to ICE? Um, and if you have something coming out really strongly from the city and from the state, from the Protect Our Courts Act, then you can have this thing to rely back on and say, no, there's this very clear statement by everybody that our courts are not working with ICE and that if ICE wants to come after you, they have to go through all of these processes. Let's talk about you. Let's talk about your case. How big of a risk are you at being detained by ICE? Just because ICE is there for another person doesn't mean they can pick you up also while being there because they find out that you are also somebody who might not be in lawful immigration status. And so I do think that it certainly provides us with a much better tool to be able to give our clients information and assurances. I also, oh, can I go back? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I also think it's important to recognize, too, because we will have a lot of work to do because there has been such a big chilling effect. And, and I think that requires, someone had mentioned funding earlier on, pre on previous panels, right? And I think funding for organizations to do community organizing, and I think it's very important to put more resources in that because the communities are very strong, the misinformation they hear is very strong, and most people who, most organizations who are working with immigrants already are so backlogged. <laughs> and so we really wanna make sure that there is also a plan in place for implementation on really doing community um, outreach and education. Just one, one quick addition to what's been said is that of course I believe that there's, a, there's an ability to improve. If there wasn't, then why did we do this work? But more importantly is what if we don't act? This chilling effect can 
eliminate all forms of justice for our clients. And it, what it does is it legitimizes for our clients, for example, for domestic violence victims, what they keep hearing, if you ask for help, ICE will get you. So I think what's most dangerous is the failure to act. Yeah, agreed, agreed. And hopefully this session will be the session. Uh, Chair Lansman? Okay, thank you so much. Our next panel, last panel, last panel? Last panel, we have uh, Make the Road. Uh, Miriam Martinez, please. Uh, Anti-Violence Project, are, are you still in the house? I think you might have already left. Uh, Virginia Gog Goggin, Greg Waltman, uh, Fernanda, Hipsinson, the, the Council of People's Organization. And is there anyone else that submitted a, an appearance card, but it was not called? Anybody else want to testify today? Okay, great. Yep. If we can start here to the left. Okay, that's fine too. Please. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Luis Bautista, and I'm an immigration attorney at Make the Road New York. I'm going to be interpreting for Miriam Hernandez, who is a Make the Road community member. Mi nombre es Miriam Martinez. Hoy estoy aquí porque quiero compartir con el Consejo Municipal cómo migración ha afectado mi vida y por qué necesitamos que la legislatura estatal apruebe y que el gobierno, en que el gobernador como firme la, la ley de protección de, de nuestros tribunales. Mi esposo Plutarco Ramírez fue arrestado por migración en julio del 2018, luego de ser acusado falsamente de un crimen que luego fue retirado. Su detención cambió drásticamente nuestra, mi vida diaria. Por primera vez mi familia fue separada. La forma en que arrestaron a mi esposo fue muy difícil. Y gracias al trabajo de Make the Road New York, mi esposo Plutarco está de regreso con nosotros. Él continúa luchando. Su caso desde afuera, yo he escuchado historias donde personas han sido detenidas fuera de la corte y mientras mi esposo estuvo en el albergue, él también escuchó historias similares. El día anterior, cuando mi esposo Plutarco fue arrestado por migración, él tenía la cita en la corte. Después de que la cita había terminado, accidentalmente salimos por la parte de atrás. Por eso, estoy segura que mi esposo no fue arrestado porque si hubiésemos salido por la parte de enfrente, él sí hubiese sido arrestado por migración. Perdón. Inmigración detiene a las personas sin dejarles saber quiénes son, mientras que las personas están tratando de resolver sus casos en los tribunales. La ley de protección de nuestros tribunales mitigará los arrestos fuera de las cortes exigirá que los agentes de migración muestren las órdenes judiciales antes de arrestar a alguien. Esto ayudará a las personas a no tener miedo a acudir a los tribunales, lo que puede ser peligroso para sus casos. Apoyo esta acta por estas razones. Como inmigrante y residente de Nueva York, la presencia de inmigración y control de aduanas ICE en los juzgados de Nueva York es una táctica utilizada para aterrorizar a nuestras comunidades de inmigrantes y pone en peligro su derecho constitucional a acceder a los tribunales y a nuestro sistema judicial. La máquina de deportación de Trump no tiene lugar en nuestros juzgados. Los neoyorquinos no debemos temer que nuestras familias no, no sean robadas cuando acceden a los tribunales. Mi esposo y yo apoyamos la ley de protección a nuestros tribunales que permitirá que todos los neoyorquinos, sin importar el estatus migratorio, tengan acceso igual a, un, a, a seguros a la Corte de Nueva York. Muchas gracias. My name is Miriam Martinez. I'm here today because I want to share with the City Council how immigration has affected my life and why the, the state legislature must pass and for Governor Cuomo to sign the Protect Our Courts Act. My husband, Plutarco Ramirez, was arrested by immigration on July 2018 after being falsely charged with a crime that was later dropped. His detention drastically shifted my everyday life. 
For the first time, my family was torn apart. The way that Plutarco was detained was very difficult, and thanks to the, to the work of Make the Road New York, Plutarco is now back with us and continue to fight his case from the outside. I have, I have heard the stories of people who have been detained outside of the court, and while my husband was in immigration detention, he also heard similar stories. The day before Plutarco was arrested by immigration, he had a court appearance, and after the court appearance was over, we accidentally left the courthouse through the back, but I am sure if Plutarco and I had left through the front, immigration would have detained him right there. Immigration detains people without letting them know who they are while people are trying to fix their cases in the court. The Protect Our Courts Act will, will help mitigate arrests outside the courts, require immigration agents to show judicial warrants before arresting someone. It will help people not be afraid to go to court, which can be risky for their cases. I support this bill for these reasons as an immigrant and a, York, and a, and a New York resident. The presence of ICE in New York courthouses is a tactic being used to terrorize our immigrant community and undermines their constitutional right to access courts in our judicial system. Trump's deportation machine has no place in our courthouses, and New Yorkers should not fear being ripped away from their families when accessing our courts. My, husband's, my husband and I support the Protect Our Courts Act, which will allow all New Yorkers, regardless of immigration status, to have equal and safe access to New York courts. Uh, señora Martínez, le, le quiero decir gracias por estar aquí con nosotros y por la confianza que tiene en nosotros en oír ese testimonio de lo que pasó con su, su esposo y su familia. Eso no debe de pasar y por eso estamos aquí. Y, y qué bueno que están aquí hablando de, de su historia para cambiar la vida de otros más que, que quieren justicia y merecen justicia. So, muchas gracias por eso y Make the Road, lo que ellos hacen cada día. Um, porque debemos estar aquí en parte de esta democracia uh, empujando y um, abo como abogados de, de justicia. So, gracias por, por eso y, y ojalá que logramos algo muy, algo muy importante y específico con esta ley um, porque eso merecemos aquí. Y eso es en el nivel est estatal, pero con esto pasamos una resolución uh, de todas las voz de la ciudad. Y eso, eso cuenta por mucho, porque todo lo que está pasando aquí está pasando en la ciudad, no nomás en el estado, pero más aquí. So, gracias por estar aquí como new york newyorkino. Muchísimas gracias por escucharnos. Muchas gracias. Uh, ok, thank you. Ok, gotcha. Uh, thank you for having me today. My name is Fernanda Hipskin. I'm an immigration attorney at the Council of People's Organization. Uh, we predominantly serve the South Asian community, um, and we have seen a strong chilling effect uh, regarding uh, people being arrested by or near or inside courthouses. The clients have told us uh, that they have been hearing rumors of courthouses arrests uh, for years, especially in an environment um, of generalized fear and anxiety created by the rhetoric of the current administration. Uh, this has spread quickly enough that we have seen immigrants too scared to show up to court, uh, even to support a family or community member or serve as witnesses. This has been true of immigrants with every le level of status as they feel that the Trump administration will use any excuse to get rid of them. They know that ICE shows up to courthouse arrests and makes courthouses arrests. This is discouraging the legal process and forcing judges to make decisions without full access to witnesses. Without some sort of relief, we expect to hear more stories of immigrants too scared to show up to court, many of whom have legitimate avenues of relief, but are intimidated and bullied into undocumented life, leaving them vulnerable to these types of arrests. The Protect Our Codes Act would serve to ensure that individuals who are trying to do the right thing, either for themselves and their case, or to assist family members in the process, are given the protection necessary to do so. Um, and I would like to share one example of a client that I had not that long ago. Um, she had been sexually assaulted and I was doing a consultation with her and I explained the process to obtain a U visa. And in that process, I explained that it was uh, very likely that she would have to go to court at some point. Um, and in the end, she said, I'm scared. And I said, okay, are you scared of the attacker? And she said, no, I'm scared of ICE. Um, so I don't think that the, she will be the only one that I see that will tell me the same thing. She hasn't been the only one that I've seen um, that has told me that in different types of scenarios, if, if I may. 
Um, and so, you know, I do believe that I can speak for myself and other members of the Council of People's Organization that we strongly support this act. Thank you. Councilman Nchaka, Greg Waltman, G1 Quantum, the clean energy company called G1 Quantum. Um, but the uh, issues are, are pretty complex. Um, so where should we begin? Uh, obviously, you had Christian Nielsen being or resigning or being let go. But I wouldn't say that um, that, that is uh, indicative of anything new um, or a new policy coming from the administration to help resolve the issue. Again, the issue remains one of a value-based hyper-protectionism within the media and narratives of the viability of alternative solutions. Solutions, like I suggested to you a couple weeks ago, the solar wall opportunity. Because if you're putting solar panels on 2,000 miles of border wall, all of a sudden you have new jobs and you're creating 242 trillion kilowatt hours of energy or $291 billion of energy per year. And then you're able to export energy to Latin America for cheaper, which on average pays 20 to 25% more in energy prices, reducing the barrier to entry for Latin American citizens to participate in the global economy and resolving chain migratory issues through that type of proprietary application. But the, the issue remains one of the value scope of uh, the narratives or solutions being suggested to the public. So if these solutions are superior course of action, um, these, these exist, it's one of um, parsing through these value-based protectionist narratives to make sure that these alternative solutions do in fact exist so that a more diverse conversation can be created to resolve these issues. And, and it does go, come down to the courts and the court's discretion, but through improperly type of value bench trial monopolies and um, type of graft and malversation that um, these people have testified to, um, obviously taking a, a, a broader stance, a broader approach through this, this bill and legislation um, is appropriate. Thank you. Thank you for that, and and I think what what I what I heard you say very plainly was how do we how do we come up with more solutions and and different solutions and bring different people to the table for that discussion and and I and I hope that this that that's what I mean we started this conversation with the commissioner giving some incredibly eloquent personal uh, reflections about what we recently did with the committee and how we've changed the makeup of the committee to ensure that everyone feels welcome here to speak to us directly about some of these things that are so traumatic. Uh, we're not just hearing from lawyers, we're hearing from advocates and we're hearing from people who have been personally impacted like Ms. Martinez. And that's, that's important and that's what we're trying to do here. So thank you and I hope you feel welcomed, all of you. Um, I have a I have a question for Ms. Martinez. Tengo una pregunta para usted. Si si nos puede decir más en en todo lo que um, pasó con su esposo y, y su familia en los cortes. Uh, Hay algo que la ciudad puede hacer más en en recursos para usted para apoyar uh, el proceso dentro de los cortes. Algo que hizo bien o lo que pueden hacer de nuevo en el futuro. Tiene ideas de, 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 de cómo podemos ayudar la ciudad específicamente. Yo creo que apoyando más a los programas como Make It the Road, que ellos a mí no me dejaron en ningún momento. Yo tenía pavor, miedo de ir a las cortes. La, las personas de Make It the Road me acompañaron, me dieron el soporte emocional. Mm. Um, porque inclusive mis. ¿Y quién era un abogado o, o un como social worker o oh. quién? abogado, social worker, este, inclusive mi hija este, hoy día es parte del movimiento de Make the Road de, de adolescentes, mm. porque ella también tenía miedo de, ella es nacida aquí, pero ella tenía miedo de, de ver a un policía, tenía miedo de ir a una corte, entonces ella dice, mami, ¿cómo yo puedo ayudar? Entonces, eh, sí es brindando, brindándole más apoyo a las asociaciones, este, como ciudadanos, pues no tener ese miedo de ir a una corte, uh -huh. eh, no tener el miedo de, la, de, de ver a un policía y pedirle ayuda, o sea, que ellos den esa confianza para que uno diga, ok, me pasó algo, yo puedo llamar a la policía y sé que no van a llamar a ICE. 
Uh, I asked Ms. Martinez what could the city do essentially to support um, her and having gone through it with her husband and her testimony, what could the city do? And she quickly pointed to Make the Road and really supporting Make the Road as an organization and uh, an organization that was with her every step of the way, bringing a lawyer, uh, but also bringing other resources for her and her daughter, uh, who's even her daughter who is American born uh, is, is fearful too of police. And that, that I think is, is what she's kind of describing as, as the real need and how we can, how we can and th that's something we can do as a city. We can support the family as they walk through um, in and out of the courts and, out of, and in and out of immigration needs. And, and that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing here in the, in the Immigration Committee, and that's what we're fighting for every single budget to ensure that they get, uh, that all immigrants get access to, to justice. Muchas gracias por su respuesta. I don't think I have any other questions for, for you all. I do want to end with this. Um, not only an incredible thank you to all the staff, both from the Justice Committee, but also the, the Immigration Committee. And we started this conversation with the reports, and the reports offer data. And what, what I think is so, so important about this is that we have both testimony that's connected to the impact and the trauma that's happening in our courts that are supposed to be delivering justice. And that's part of how, the only way that our, our, our government and our democracy and the promise of the Constitution and, and what America's all about requires that, that branch of government to be strong. And, and that's being impacted by the executive right now in a very big way. And so how do we do that? The legislative body is moving forward to propose a law to change that structure, to, to return to a better justice system. And so, but it has to be fueled not just with stories that are so impactful and we gotta tell those stories, but we also through data. And we're seeing that data. And both IDP um, and the work uh, that the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs has put together um, and uh, Bronx Legal Services and Make the Road and all these organizations that are bringing the data forward to tell the stories through numbers about how it's actually impacting people from applying to you and T visas um, and asking for a lawyer and, uh, and reporting crimes in their neighborhood. That's, that's, that's how our society can work. And so this is, this is, this is what makes it so fundamental. And that's where we're here, and then we're gonna advocate for passage of this law. Uh, and very soon we'll vote on it on the floor of the city council, hopefully with unanimous support, um, to send that message to, to Albany, to the governor, to the state senate, and the state assembly. So thank you all for your, your support today, and, and we'll see you at the next immigration committee hearing. Thank you.